All right, hello everybody. Welcome to this presentation about sourcing wild foods for your reptiles. Uh, we're really excited about this. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, to begin, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Roy Arthur Blodgett, and I'm the sole proprietor behind Wellspring Herpetoculture and the co-host of the Project Herpetoculture podcast alongside my handsome co-host there on the opposite side of the screen, Phil. What's up, guys? Uh, my name is Philip Leitz, and uh, Roy and I make up the Project Herpoculture podcast, and I am the owner-operator of Arids Only, and i um, really excited to put together this, uh, this, little, this little webinar. Hopefully, you guys get something useful out of it. Yeah, it's going to be fun. I'm excited for this. Yeah, so true that. Yeah, and so before we do that, I want to talk a little bit about Happy Dragons and what we're doing over there. So I'm going to um, transition here to the Happy Dragons Plus platform to talk about that. So um, this is Happy Dragons Plus, which is launched now, and we're very excited about it. This is our new subscription platform that we've all been working on. Phil and I and the team at Happy Dragons have put together this amazing resource and um, this is the landing page here where you'd begin. Um, in the future, our webinars here will be moving to Happy Dragons Plus. You can see over on this side, there's the events tab. Um, we'll have stuff going on there. And um, that's kind of where we're gonna be home basing, so to speak. Um, and we really want this to serve as a foundation for for the herb community, you know, um, a community of reptile experts, reptile owners, and suppliers working together to improve the care of our animals and just do it better. Um, we're really excited about that. And to support that, we'll also be launching some courses in a few months here. You can see down over here, we've got some course set up and these will be filled out soon, of course. Um, I'm really excited about that. I'm kind of eagerly working away on um, preparing all of that. So. In addition, um, breeders will be posting um, exclusive offers here on um, for the Happy Dragons Plus of members, like clutch announcements, and you'll have the ability to DM and um, reserve animals directly. Um, so that's gonna be over here in our breeder board. I've actually got a post here active right now about some Spilodi sulfurius that I will be offering here shortly. That I've been raising up these hatched um, last October um, and in addition there's also a um, an exclusive offer for bug factory products right now that we're giving out for the early adopters uh, at Happy Dragons Plus so that's really exciting um, so we've got both a monthly and a quarterly subscription and um, for quarterly members we'll be offering ex ex um, exclusive enclosure reviews from Mariah Healy and other forms of reptile care consulting in the future. 
So you'll be able to go over here and do some Reptifiles consulting. We'll also have expert Q&A, uh, breeder Q&A. You can talk with any of the breeders on the platform about um, what they're doing, anything you might need help with. You'll be able to do that through this platform pretty easily. And also, in addition to all of this, in a few weeks, we'll be launching the Happy Dragons Plus store. And there you'll have exclusive um, offers and discounts for Happy Dragons Plus members. Um, you can expect 10% off on the store. In addition to that Bug Factory product um, discount, which is a 50% discount right now for Happy Dragons Plus users. Pretty awesome. So on top of all of that, we're also going to have a um, mobile app for the community coming down the pike. Um, some smart tech, uh, smart tech announcements and some raffles will be upcoming for each webinar. So um, yeah, check out Happy Dragons Plus. If you look in the video description, you will find links to Happy Dragons Plus and both the monthly and quarterly subscriptions. And I highly recommend checking those out. And um, pretty shortly here, we're gonna get into our um, our actual educational content for the webinar. But um, but before we um, dive into all of that, I also wanted to mention that there will be a raffle held at the end of today's webinar for some really awesome prizes. Um, here's what that's gonna look like. We're gonna have, uh, it looks like six drawings total. So the first three drawings will be a three month free trial of Happy Dragons Plus. Uh, the next two drawings will be the free trial plus a reptile sticker pack. And the final drawing will be a three month free trial plus a $100 Josh's Frogs gift card. So Whoa. that's pretty rad. Um, yeah, but with all that said- I'm not eligible, right? I'm not eligible for the drawing. <laughs> Phil, get out of here, Phil. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so what we'll do is um, Folks um, in the chat will be um, will be collected by the folks at Happy Dragons. They'll put that into a, a random selector generator thing, and then they'll let me know who the raffle winners are uh, when we get to that section, and um, we'll follow up, um, yeah, with all of that towards the end. So, um, yeah, I think that we're ready to go with the um, presentation. Phil, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, definitely. So this is going to be uh, this particular instantiation um, of, of the webinar is going to be a little bit more conversational. Um, it, it's not one that I think lends itself to having like a lot of visual aids. So um, even though we do have, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Roy, we do have like a couple of slides here, right, that we can utilize yeah. and, and have to. Well, we actually, we don't necessarily have slides, but um, for this one, we have a PDF. Um, you'll see oh, in the right. video description, there's a companion PDF, and that's just going to be kind of reiterating a lot of the content we'll be going through here, just kind of like um, in a simple, simplistic format for folks to keep it fresh in their memory. But um, most of the kind of the juicy stuff that we're going to be going over verbally, I feel like that's probably the best yeah. way to do it with this one. Yeah, absolutely. So if you guys uh, get, a, get a load of that PDF, I think that'll be really, really helpful. Um, but I'm just going to kind of dive right into this and, uh, please Roy, like if, if, if yeah. need be stop me for any reason, add however you feel like adding, um, et cetera, et cetera. So basically the way I like to think about this stuff is that finding and utilizing wild foods, wild food items is a phenomenal and healthy practice for enriching the lives of our captive herpetofauna. Um, I think of wild foods personally as anything that's not bought in a store. So, um, uh, you know, and that can include anything from stuff that I grow in my garden, uh, you know, specifically, uh, or stuff that I go find that's just living out in the world. Um, to me, both of those sort of equate a wild food. Um, I mean, I think there's probably a little bit of a gray area where if I'm like growing lettuce and endive and things like that in a garden in my backyard, it feels a little less wild than if I'm just picking a wild dandelion, but I still kind of think of it as, as fundamentally different from just buying uh, food items that we buy at the store. Part of the reason this is important to note is because um, anytime we're buying, say, plant food matter from the store, uh, we are sort of outsourcing a lot of, uh, a lot of the work that goes into making that food. Mm -hmm. So we don't get to control, uh, all the quality that goes into it. 
We don't get to control the way it's handled and transported. We don't get to control, um, outside of buying organic, we don't really get to control the level of herbicide, pesticide, artificial fertilizers, manures, things like this that go into your, your plant foods. And then conversely, or, or simultaneously, I guess, rather, um, anytime you're buying uh, store-bought insect or rodent or you know sort of live animal feeders, um, we're sort of outsourcing the same kind of thing. Uh, we don't really get the opportunity to dictate what those feeders are fed um, unless we gut load them in advance of feeding our animals. We don't get to dictate how those animals live their lives in advance of um, being fed to our animals. We don't get to dictate what you know we know or don't know for sure about what they've been exposed to, et cetera, et cetera. So even though it's not necessary, you know, and it, it, none of this is to say that it's dangerous to buy store-bought stuff for your pet at all. Um, it's just that doing this, uh, utilizing wild foods offers everything from psychological stimulation it offers nutrient diversity, and we'll get into that a little bit later about why that's important. Um, it, it can save a little, a little bit of money depending on the season, mm -hmm. right? Because you're not paying for the wild foods that you're that you're utilizing most of the time. Um, and it's a, it's just actually a great fun activity to get yourself outside. Uh, yeah. This has been something that's really kind of helped me get outside and get to know my local environment a little bit more. So it's kind of like a psychological enrichment for your for your herp and for you in yeah. some ways. Um, and often, oftentimes, wild food items, even if they are uh, the same thing that you might buy at the store, they're, they're, they're almost a completely different food source from what you would buy at a store. So like, let's take, for example, just a, a, a typical cricket, right? A, a cricket that you're going to buy from the store is going to come from a cricket farm, mm -hmm. and that cricket farm is going to have their practices in terms of how they, they scale their operation, how they... Uh, formalize and um, systematize feeding rearing etc cetera, etc cetera. and you you have to understand that the the goals of some uh, a place like a cricket farm it, their goal is to generate as many healthy viable feeders as possible in a short amount of time mm -hmm. and to maximize profit which again this isn't a, that's not net meant to be a criticism at all it's just it's just meant to illustrate the ways that goals uh, will dictate kind of the end result of the product that we make. Whereas a cricket that you find outside uh, near your house, say, for example, is going to have a completely different nutrient content because mm -hmm. it's just out there living its wild life as a regular cricket. So it's going to be, generally speaking, just more natural. It's going to have more nutrient diversity in it, and it's probably just going to be a little bit better of a healthy food item in the same way that it's probably healthier for you and I to eat say uh you know like a, a deer like a mm -hmm. wild like wild game wild game is going to be a little bit healthier for you than like a, a a cow that's been raised in a feedlot its whole life and fed a bunch of hormones and a bunch of antibiotics and all this other stuff to get it up to size immediately right yeah it's kind of the way i like to think about the difference between feeding store-bought and wild foods now in fairness I don't think there's cricket farms feeding their crickets hormones or anything like that. So we're, we're not quite getting in quite the same territory, but it's, it's the, the, the gist behind the practice is similar. Yeah. That's um, a good analogy, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, and then sort of simultaneously, uh, not only are you able to get, uh, something in a wild food item that might have an analog in a store-bought food item. Uh, sourcing food from the environment around you and, and, and the wild that is in, in your in your area is actually it's also a way of getting food items that wouldn't otherwise be available at a at a pet store right you're, you're not going to be able to find a pet store in which you can find for example wild spiders right you're not going to be able to find spiders for sale as feeders at a, at a reptile store so it's not in the cards and yet spiders and lots of other food items that we'll talk about later uh, end up being really excellent, um, excuse me, uh, really excellent feeders f uh, for various insectivorous reptiles. So yeah, uh, let's talk about a couple of main considerations when sourcing your wild foods. Okay. And I, and I tried to boil this down to three main points because from my perspective, outside of these three main points, there, there, there isn't really a lot to, to, to worry about. Um, and the, and the first major consideration, and this one is probably near and dear to most everybody's hearts, um, 
is the likelihood of exposure to environmental toxins, mm -hmm. right? So one, one super easy way to understand and illustrate this would be, let's say I wanted to feed, I have, I have a th uh, three corn snakes, right? As, as pets, my wife and I have, have three corn snakes on top of all the lizards that we have. And, uh, now and again, I'd like to feed them wild rodents because I know that those wild rodents are going to be more analogous to the food that they evolved to eat. It's going to be a little bit more similar, probably a better nutrient ratio, right? Um, but in order to source those wild rodents, I have to be as sure as I possibly can be that those rodents haven't been eating rodent poison, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. haven't been eating uh, putrid foods or, or rotten foods that might be in their digestive system and might not be giving them anything and not showing any symptoms. And then all of a sudden I feed them to my snake and then that gives some sickness to my snake. So this is uh, this is one consideration that we're always trying to bear in mind uh, when we're, when we're finding wild foods. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 uh, the second uh, consideration is um, ease of acquisition. And I think this is really important because um, there's a lot of ways one could think of this. Um, oh, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. Bless you. Holy smokes. Ooh. Thank you. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so ease of acquisition is pretty important because, uh, number one, this is a sliding scale. If you w decide to make a day out of going mothing with your with your kids say for example mm -hmm. and you collect a whole mess of those moths to use as feeders tomorrow for some of, for your bearded dragon or your collared lizard or your xenogama or whatever it is then then it's it that's great that's it's great to do. you've mm -hmm. combined a, a, a really fun wholesome activity that is educational for you and your family and you've managed to get some feeders for your animals um but it's also worth considering that if we're going to say that time is money then it's it's probably not worth investing all your time in collecting wild foods if it takes you 12 hours to collect all those foods, right? Mm -hmm. at, at a certain point, we want to make sure that what we're doing is easy enough. The bar is low. The bar for entry is low, um, because then we're going to be more likely to do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, you know, there's an old saying that says uh, sometimes the juice isn't worth the squeeze, right? So make sure that if you're going to go through the trouble of, of of sourcing wild food or finding a wild food item for your animal, that it's worth it for you, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Um, just another example of this personally is I'll take a, a day where I decide, okay, my whole way of exercising today is going to be to stroll through this field for two and a half hours. And I'm going to have a butterfly net and two bat, a jar and a bag, mm -hmm. and I'm going to pick a bunch of wild flowers and I'm going to catch a bunch of grasshoppers. And that's going to be the food for my animals for the next two days. Mm -hmm. And that's fun. And it's a physical activity. And so I'll count that as my, my exercise for the day. Right. So it's, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, just a good consideration to have. Um, all right. And then the third consideration, and this is one that's both a, a consideration and a bit of a way of saying, don't sweat this too much, which is possible illness vector, right? So a lot of times, I think probably the primary concern I've heard from people when I say, hey, you should consider finding some wild foods for your animal to help make them a little bit happier. A lot of times people will say something like, oh, well, I'm worried about getting them sick mm -hmm. because they're worried that, that this wild food is going to be carrying a disease or a parasite or whatever that's going to hurt my, my herp. And Which is very number fair. one, totally fair, totally understandable. But there's a, there's a few things to consider here. Number one, most animals in the wild, they're surviving because they're healthy, right? Animals that are disease ridden or injured or or whatever have a tendency to be selected out of the of the existing population of a species with some regularity by predators. It's one of the duties that predators serve, uh, mm -hmm. uh, both predators and um, decomposers, right? So this is generally speaking, you're, you're very unlikely to get to catch an animal that's going to be carrying some horrific disease that your animal's immune system, as long as they're healthy and well kept, mm -hmm. can't handle on their own. OK, so that's that's the first thing that to, to, to remember. The second thing to remember is that sometimes the the the, the risks are outweighed by the benefits. Mm -hmm. So, OK, maybe. This grasshopper has a, you know, a very small pathogen or a little protozoan that might potentially be a little bit harmful to my insectivorous captive lizard. But I understand that the likelihood of it turning into like a systemic infection is very low. And the benefits of giving them both a, 
a wild food that's going to be fun for them to catch, kill, and eat, mm -hmm. and the nutrient diversity that is going to be gained from giving them a wild food item that's been raised out there in the world mm -hmm. is way higher than the risk of them getting sick. So right. that's something to consider. And then the last thing to consider it kind of as a subtext in this, in this one category is going to be, um, if anything, you are as likely or, or uh, it could even be argued more likely to, to introduce a pathogen to your captive herb by way of a store-bought food item. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. um, the crickets we buy from the shops, uh, are, you know, often can carry things like coccidia and pinworm and hookworm and like they are just as likely if not more likely to carry harmful protozoa than anything else and and part of this is related to the the nature of of raising and rearing high numbers of similar species in a small space so in other words a farm type environment right one of the reasons that a lot of meat meat producers and farmers have to give a lot of their or choose to give their animals a lot of antibiotics is in order to counteract the sort of breeding ground for disease that yeah. a lot of these sort of highly concentrated groups of animals uh yield so um especially when they can't get good. away from their own waste you know that's in places right like like again like you made the feedlot example earlier but that's a perfect example i think there mm -hmm. that's exactly right now uh on top of that this is also true of our plant matter that we buy at the store. So even when you choose to buy organic, you might be uh, – you can introduce certain uh, bacterial and, 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 and other various um, illnesses by way of your plant matter too because uh, you know a lot of times different various manures and usually animal manures are being used for, for soils and, and, and fertilizers. Um, and you know you you know you you just don't always know exactly what you're getting in the mix when we're talking about uh, sort of the farming practice, even of an organic farm, yeah. right? And yeah. so, um, and especially for non-organic farms too. I mean, I've heard, yeah. I've heard of people, for example, um, like that that raise grasshoppers as feeders, losing mm -hmm. entire grasshopper colonies because they were out of organic lettuce, so they fed you know, a conventional a lettuce pesticide. and there, there is residual pesticide on that lettuce that actually wiped out their colony. Um, right. that's even after washing the greens to some extent. So, right. Things right. to keep in mind. Yeah, that's great. That's a, I really appreciate that addition, Roy. That's super true. So all of this stuff is, is, is not meant to frighten you because again, healthy herbs should have no problem dealing with these, with most of these things, right? Most mm -hmm. of the time, all of this stuff is just going to be a normal part of the, the, the life of a, of a captive herb. And as long as they're well cared for, you can expect them to manage and handle most illnesses that they might be presented with. And if, if not, right, and this is, again, this is not just wild foods. This is all foods. If not, then it's usually you're not going to get anything that's going to be utterly lethal to your animal. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're more likely for it to be something that's just going to give them a mild illness in worst case scenario, they might need a little bit of medication, but this is, again, this is quite rare. Um, just as an example, I have uh, my poor male Boris uh, Thomasi, he's my oldest Euromastix Thomasi. He may be at the end of his life right now. Mm -hmm. He's kind of barely kicking along. He's about 16 years old, and I've been feeding him wild plant matter for his entire life. And this is an animal where I can safely say I've never had to medicate him. He's never had a problem. And I've been mm -hmm. giving him wild nonsense for 16 plus years. So mm -hmm. again, this is anecdata. I'm not saying this is always the case. I'm just saying that um, this is everything that's contained in this 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 description is is going to be all stuff that I've done. So yeah, uh, keep the, keep that in mind. Yeah, and it's also um, worth noting that it's there's no world of pet keeping in which you can completely eliminate risk in every way you know it's all mitigation and it's um you know as i as i alluded to earlier with like the you know store-bought greens there's potential risk even there so it's really about um doing these things mindfully and that's yeah. hopefully what we're trying to help you do today with this presentation yeah that's that's an absolutely perfect way of putting it yeah all of this is just designed to give you exactly what roy just said more mindful informed ways of sourcing your wild foods and don't don't sweat about eliminating risk entirely because it's not possible okay so now i'd like to talk a little bit about um 
places from which you might be able to source both wild plant and insect or other uh, matter to feed your animals, right? So um, a couple considerations would be uh, population density, right? So uh, Roy and I, were when we were talking about giving this presentation, uh, one of the subjects that came up was um, I have taken up fly fishing in the last few months, and I fished for a long time for most of my life, but fly fishing in particular has kind of become a new one for me over the last few months. And I've been fishing in a couple of areas, both more remote and one in particular, a little more close into town, right? So Boulder Creek uh, here in, in Boulder, Colorado, great trout stream. Uh, something that you that's I've noticed about some of the trout that I catch real close into the city center of Boulder is some of the trout have little growths, little, mm -hmm. little, little bizarre deformities or like a tumor mm -hmm. on their mouths or somewhere around their, uh, on their body. And while I can't be sure that this is the result of environmental toxins, I'm very unlikely to keep and eat a fish that I may be caught right in the middle of Boulder, mm -hmm. uh, rather than a, a fish caught out of the same river, but about five, 10 miles upstream into the Canyon, I might be more likely to keep one of those fish. Right. Yeah. So, um, this same concept can apply to our uh, uh, sourcing of, of wild foods. I tend to avoid sourcing foods, both plant and insect or animal, from highly populated urban areas. And there's other reasons for this too. Um, one is, is spaces, the closer you get to city centers, those spaces that are open and, and tend to be free have a tendency to be managed by the city, which mm -hmm. means they're going to be very likely going to be managed with things like uh, herbicides, pesticides, artificial fertilizers, whatnot, right? Mm -hmm. uh, more likely to have wild animal management tactics involved like mouse and rat poisons and traps and whatnot. And, and in fairness, um, a lot of cities are opting to use more uh, environmentally friendly methods for this now. Uh, but regardless, this is something you have to take into consideration. It's also worth taking into consideration that uh, even if you rule out the management by a like a local government, you have to rule in the fact that all the other people that you share that space with might not be respecting the environment the same way that you are. Mm -hmm. So they may be littering more, they may be dumping stuff more, and all of that stuff gets into the local area and so it's just something to be aware of. It doesn't mean you can't source foods from those places. It's just to remind you that that's something that can happen and, and is something that you should consider if and when that might be your only option if you live in a highly densely populated area, okay? Uh, better localities for sourcing wild foods are going to be things like, number one, your backyard. There, there is no better place for you to control what's available to you than what's in your own backyard. Yeah. Okay. So for example, my mother, uh, she uses bless, her whole backyard. Bless her. Yeah. She's the best man. <laughs> the best lady ever. Uh, she is very, very studious in planting dozens and dozens of flowers that are edible for your mastics. And she she makes she takes a lot of care not to eliminate dandelions from her yard, and she plants wild alfalfa and this whole thing. So she does a great job of, uh, you know, helping facilitate her son's weird obsession with with lizards and reptiles. So almost every day during the spring and summer, when I go over to drop off my dog uh, to hang out with her brother uh, at my mom's house, I will pick wild foods and flowers from the yard uh in the area we've uh we've also got some agreements with many of the neighbors that they know they're not going to spray herbicides in their yard and i'm going to pick all the dandelions so this is a great way for me to get dandelions for all of my herbivorous reptiles mm. now uh make sure that you ask for permission if you do this right mm -hmm. don't just go into your neighbor's yard and start picking all their stuff right? Just let them know. And most people, they're pretty cool about it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I, I've found that people are mostly intrigued, uh, you know, but, and of course, if someone doesn't want you to do it, don't do it. If you trespass on their land, that's a good way to get shot. This is America. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't mess around. Right. So your yard and neighbor's yards are great. Open spaces 
uh, like uh, one, uh, one great one is uh, uh, open leash dog parks or just open wild like trails and spaces, BLM land, all this stuff is not going to be – and state parks mm-hmm. are not going to be bastardized by as much uh, government interference. There's not going to be a lot of um, spraying of pesticides and herbicides on these lands. And so therefore you can trust that a lot of what you're going to find there is just going to be like mostly wild or entirely wild food. OK, um, now, obviously, and it's you also be very, very. Yeah, well, I was going to say, it's also important to note local regulations if you are going to be foraging in places like that, because some places are OK with that and other places yeah. are not. So, for example, like, you know, National Forest Land, BLM land is going to have like highly different uh, regulations regarding foraging, typically than, say, a state park would. Um, but it right. can really vary depending on where you are. And um, usually you can find that information pretty easily by consulting your local ranger whether it's your park ranger, or BLM office, anything like that. Absolutely. That's exactly what I was going to say next. I okay. was going to follow up. I'm like, don't do anything illegal. You know? <laughs> like, don't go collecting some endangered shrew to feed to your corn snake. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's worth. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's hilarious. Um, so that's, 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 that's really, really important. Now, uh, with that in mind, how do how do we know like uh, you know what we're collecting is going to be safe for our animals, mm-hmm. right? This is this is probably another thing uh, that people tend to worry about. So uh, when it comes to plant matter, at least uh, we can there we have a, a couple of avenues we can go we can use um, to find out this information. The first is plant identification apps. Mm-hmm. Okay. There are dozens of these both for plants and insects and bugs and other, you know, uh, arachnids and whatnot all over. There, there's dozens of them. Um, if you look – and this is one of the things I love about our fancy smartphones. Mm-hmm. I love having these identification apps because at the very least I can be reasonably sure that what I've got is what that thing says it is. And I can generally speaking be pretty confident that it's not going to hurt them. Yeah. Okay. You can even um, use like iNaturalist and, and actually request yeah. ID on there. And this is also a cool way to just to add a little bit into this part um, about yeah, please. Um, to, to develop more literacy about like the, the other creatures that you're living with, you know, um, learn about your wild neighbors more. It's a really great way to do that. Um, you know, I, my introduction to a lot of just like a general knowledge of native plants was a, originally an interest in what are the native plants around me that are edible. And then of course, so that kind of snowballed and now I have a much broader understanding and interest in it. So I just wanted to plug that as like a cool ecological literacy tool as well. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. I, that was, that's a, that's a great addition, Roy. I agree with that wholeheartedly. iNaturalist is such an underrated tool that we can use for, uh, in, enriching the lives of our, of our captive herps. Mm-hmm. Um, with that in mind, Along with your plant identification apps and iNaturalist, you can also visit, there are sites such as the tortoise table.org slash UK, mm-hmm. which is, it's a, um, it's a great one because it helps give you the understanding of toxicity of various plants, at least with relationship to many tortoise species. Now, this isn't always going to be a perfect allegory for every animal because not all animals are tortoises, right? But what the what the site does is you'll type in a type of plant and it'll tell you oh the flowers of this are edible feed however many you want and then it'll say the leaves are semi-toxic feed very sparingly or mm-hmm. whatever and it'll have everything from feed as much as you feed often feed sparingly never feed at all or do not feed right so this is a great resource at least to get a, a bit of a barometer on like okay uh, maybe I won't really feed this all that often, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so this is this is a great tool. I use the tortoise table all the time when looking for wild foods uh, and specifically plant foods all over the place. Now, mm-hmm. again, it's not always perfect, right? There's wild alfalfa that occurs here in Colorado and most of the southwest United States. It's these purple, little purple flowers and, and little circular leaves that – um, all of the Euromastics love, they love this food. And on the tortoise table, it says, do not feed, mm. but I've been feeding it yearly and I mm-hmm. feed it in small amounts as a treat and the animals do just fine. Mm-hmm. Now I'm not suggesting you take crazy risks with your animal. This is more to help, um, 
help uh, assuage lots of fears around feeding the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. If you feed the wrong thing, it's very likely that it's not going to be that big of a deal, right? Mm -hmm. It might be something a little funny. They might get an upset tummy for a couple of days, but then they're going to be okay, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not necessarily going to be sweating killing your animal from one thing you feed it accidentally. Um, you're, you're unlikely to do that, okay? So let's see. Next thing here. Also in all of this be... too, it's like, I really, I think it's, it's, it's often interesting too, that a lot of the stuff that we end up foraging is stuff that, um, isn't native uh, uh, initially, oh, yeah. you know, like a lot of the stuff that you're going to be finding on tortoise table. Um, a lot of these plants are now introduced and naturalized all over the United States, but they originally came from Europe. Um, yeah. and a lot of them were brought either either intentionally or, you know, in the fur of livestock in some cases. And, yep. um, and so it's kind of an interesting thing too, where, um, you're not necessarily maybe having a deleterious impact on like sensitive native species. That's another thing I always, you know, want to oh. um, make people conscious of is, is sometimes Huge. like, like even where I live, there are a lot of amazing native edible foods here in Cal California that, um, have been cultivated by indigenous Californians for a millennia. And, um, Many of them I do not eat because they're actually threatened plants at this point, um, you know. And so even though they are edible, um, it, it can actually have a deleterious impact in some cases to eat them or to do so improperly. So that's just another thing I want to bring wow. up and keep in mind. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's really, really good stuff, Roy. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and so the same thing is true of, of bug identification apps. Now, the, the main difference is that you may not be able to get a clear answer on whether or not a specific insect or, or bug is harmful for your animal to eat. This is a lot harder uh, to quantify, right? Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we all know the classic story of how fireflies are super toxic for uh, um, most reptiles. Uh, so don't, don't, don't mess around feeding fireflies. But mm -hmm. generally speaking, I think you're going to be fairly safe uh, feeding relatively common uh, insects to, to, to most animals. Now, uh, what I'd like to do at this point is I'd like to just run through a list of some of the various types of wild foods that either I or friends of mine have collected for their captive herps. And then um, I'll just relay just a little bit of anecdote around um, examples of how I've acquired some of those uh, some of those foods. And then that'll that'll close it all out today. And uh, I would hope Roy might jump in as well because yeah. I know um, stuff some stuff I'm not even going to talk about exactly. But I know Roy feeds lots of wild foods to his various animals, both mm -hmm. herp and other. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> little inside joke for us there. So, <laughs> we have wild flowers and plants. That's just a straight up given, right? So this is everything from dandelions and wild alfalfa wild clover flowers, um, you know, various wild grasses, all of these different types of plant foods I have collected from dozens of different localities and fed to many, many species of captive herbivorous reptile. Okay. Other reptiles, right? So this is a little bit controversial. People don't always like this, but I have fed wild collected uh, banded geckos to highly predatory captive reptiles such as collared lizards, mm -hmm. uh, various monitor lizards, um, uh, as also uh, what are they? Uh, uh, Nephorus geckos, and a handful of other uh, uh, other animals. Now, this might make people a little uneasy. We don't really want to feed herp. You know, people don't like feeding herps to herps. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, some of these animals evolved to to find some of this stuff in their diet. Mm -hmm. So it's just the way it is. Um, and, and these it, are also not like necessarily a staple kind of thing. This is like, you know, yes. a, a once a year kind of thing for most of these cases. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And of course, none of this is required. This isn't what you have to do. This is oh, just yeah. what you can do. Right. Um, so this is, this is an important one. Uh, rodents. I have, uh, a, I, when I moved into the warehouse space where I, I have my facility, I remember speaking to my neighbors when I moved in and I said, Hey guys, um, do me a favor. I know we get mice occasionally in the buildings. Do me a favor and don't put down any poisons or any weird foods for them. Like I'll let me know that you have a mouse. I'll trap it. 
and I will feed it to my animals. Mm -hmm. And that's what I do. I, uh, anytime my neighbor or I get a wild mouse or, or, uh, you know, what, what not a rodent in the facility, it's trapped, it's caught and I feed it to my snakes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they love it. They go nuts. In fact, I had one corn snake escape one time and he went into the hole in the wall where all the mice come from. <laughs> and he was there for about a week and a half and I haven't had a mouse since. So wow. <laughs> it's pretty, Interesting. pretty remarkable. So that was pretty cool. Um, now there's a very long list of insect and arachnid, uh, food items that you can, you can feed to your captive herps. And, uh, almost all of these, I, I can say I've fed to mine scorpions, grasshoppers, crickets, cockroaches, moths, bees, wasps, flies, spiders, earthworms, mantids, phasmids, which are stick insects. Uh, and I'll get to a couple others here, other food items here in a second. Now, all of these different in bug foods, I've fed to one, I know, and Roy also we have fed to various insectivorous reptiles of one kind or another, okay? Mm -hmm. um, the way that bees, wasps, and flies will get fed to my stuff is that uh, I will, be, because I leave doors open in, uh, in my facility, bees, wasps, and flies of various kinds fly into the shop and hit the lights mm. inside because they've come in for the smell of, of either the, the animal poop or, or food or whatever. And they come in and then they go to find their way out and they get caught in the lights. I will trap those bugs in a jar and then kind of maim them, like shake them around and confuse them and then dump them in with baby Xena, with Xenogama tailori, both adult and babies with Pilbara rock monitors, uh, with, with skinks of various kinds. And they go nuts. They love, bees wasps and flies like absolutely love them um it's really cool actually it's been very fun and and one of the reasons i decided to do that is because one time i was out herping and what we would do is when we would let's say we caught a collared lizard and we would keep the collared lizard in a in a bag because we were going to bring him home and the collared lizard would defecate my good friend nick would sort through their poop to see if there was mm. any fragments of bugs and insects and we would find bees oh, and yeah. wasps little little exoskeletons all the time so i started doing that it was really fun um grasshoppers and crickets that's just obvious they just they're everywhere right mm -hmm. the scorpions this was a little bit different i had a friend who would send me occasional scorpions from las vegas he would catch them around his house put them in deli cups and send them to me and I would feed those scorpions to collared lizards, to various gecko species. Um, I have not done it to monitor species, but I fed them to bearded dragons before. Oh, they love them. They go crazy. It's really cool. Um, spiders, same thing. Find them around my facility. And this is everything from black widows to wolf spiders, you mm -hmm. name it. Almost everything here that eats insects loves spiders. Just yeah. loves them, including the Euromastics, by the way. And the Euromastics, well, they, I've seen them eat spiders. And, and that was not even me feeding it to them. It was me seeing a spider crawling through the cage and one of my Euros going and just picking the thing off, nabbing mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So there you have it. Earthworms. I've fed earthworms to bearded dragons. I've fed them to skinks. I fed them to garter snakes, you name it. So what I would do is I'd water my lawn in the springtime and summer, and then right around sunset, the earthworms would come up and hit the moisture, and you'd yank them out of the ground. Mm. And I would feed those to uh, to, to my various, uh, various uh, captive herps. Uh, mantids and phasmids, so praying mantises and stick bugs. The stick bugs, obviously Roy is like world famous for feeding those to his polycris. Uh <laughs> The mantises, you got to be a little bit more careful because those things can cause some damage. So make sure yeah. you're, you know, kind of supervising and feeding appropriately sized foods, right? Don't feed a giant adult praying mantis to a little baby xenogama because it might go the other way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, very, very likely to go the other way, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, the other two, uh, uh, the other last two I put on here are fish and crayfish. So when I would keep... Uh, back in the day when I was a kid and I would keep baby garter snakes and, and raise them up to adulthood, I would use a net and catch minnows out of the creek behind my house 
and feed those fish to my garter snakes by putting them in the water bowl and they would go nuts for them <laughs> right um i've also known individuals who keep uh various species of semi-aquatic reptile mm -hmm. such as like basilisks or merton's water monitors or whatever um and they i've, I've watched them feed fish and crayfish to those animals mm -hmm. uh with good results that they've caught from local creeks and rivers um so this is just uh is th that's some that's some good stuff in there um yeah I have a few Do you want to add, to add anything to some of that, Roy? Yeah, a few. So one thing I would say is that if you're concerned about, like, for example, like an insect, that you're not sure if you should feed it or not, I would always err on the side of caution, and there's no reason to do it if you don't, if you're not sure what it is, if you're not sure it's going to be okay for your herp. I'd also pay attention to aposematic coloration in insects. So often insects that are brightly colored with colors like oranges and reds, oftentimes these are insects that have some sort of toxin or poison, um, you know, some sort of adaptation to predators. And, um, and so I tend to avoid things like that. Even if I'm, even if it's just a mimicry example, I just tend to avoid it, um, as a, just as a precaution. And then, totally. um, so that's a good one to keep in mind. Um, another one I would say is that, um, like caterpillars, um, um, can be an excellent one and, um, and even growing, foods that you know in like in your garden that you know will attract certain pollinators and certain caterpillars can be um a good way to do that um uh oh yeah on the um on the fish and on crayfish one thing i like to keep in mind with that is like phil phil alluded to this earlier but like i wouldn't be collecting uh crayfish or fish or anything like that from like places near cities and stuff like that you're going to want to be doing that more um, in upland environments within the watershed totally. where there's far less likely um, going to be issues with contaminants and mm -hmm. um, bioaccumulation, all of that kind of stuff. The higher you are in your watershed, the less likely you are to encounter those kinds of things, unless you have something like a mine at the top of your watershed that could be, you know, causing issues from, from, from the top down. So having, again, these are other ways to kind of encourage more awareness about your local environment and what's going on there and where things are, where things are healthy and where things are not. Um, another thing I also tend to keep in mind when I'm actually collecting things like grasshoppers is the actual abundance of the grasshoppers. Um, you can get an idea of if a place is healthy, if there's, um, less likely to be things like pesticides is if, if there's a, you know, a great abundance of those insects, and if there's a great abundance of diversity of insects, the likelihood that you're going to be encountering those issues is a lot lower. Um, That's a great point, actually, uh, specifically referring to the grasshoppers anyway. Um, one of the places I like to collect from is straight up my mom's front yard. When I go there to drop off my dog in the mornings in the summertime, I'll walk up towards the front door and 30 grasshoppers will scatter with every step. It's just so many of them, you know, and it's yeah. like, this is, this is easy. I can spend 20 minutes walking around there with a butterfly net and a deli cup, and I can get enough grasshoppers to last me a week mm -hmm. for the small number of insectivorous reptiles that I have here at the shop. So it's, it's for really sure. cool. It's actually wild. Uh, you can't even keep up with them. There's too many. Totally. It's, it's insanity. The other thing I would say is, um, is on the, on the concern about parasites, you know, that's like, I, that's like obviously my biggest concern with co collecting wild stuff. Actually, it's, I think it's actually less concerning for me than pesticides and herbicides a lot of the time. Um, oh, yeah. just because I know that like, you know, even captive cricket farms and stuff like that are likely to carry, um, various parasites. Um, it's just, it's just, it's just common. It's, um, and it's also, uh, a certain, um, you know, load of parasites within your animal's gut fauna is, um, can be beneficial depending on the type of parasite. Obviously that's highly oh. dependent on what that is. Um, but one thing that you can do to kind of mitigate any con potential concern with that. And this is something that I also just recommend for folks, um, who are keeping reptiles generally, but is do routine fecals. Um, whether, whether, um, collecting fecals and having them done by your local vet or learning to do them yourself, because the actual process for doing fecals for most of the common parasites that you would be encountering is actually pretty easy to learn. Um, you can get your own microscope, your own floats. And, um, it's something that I've actually done in the past quite a bit and, um, did not find it to be very difficult to learn. 
So there's all kinds of online resources and um, I highly recommend Mater's um, textbook on that, um, Reptile and Amphibian Surgery. It's kind of like the, you know, the reptile medicine Bible and there's an excellent section there about common reptile parasites and um, doing fecals and all of that. So highly would recommend that. Um, trying to think if there's something else there that was on my mind. Oh, the other thing I was going to say is that um, with parasite transmission risk too, um, like I think that you're you're less likely to have harmful parasite transmission risk um, when you're crossing um, orders. So, uh, for example, um, it's less likely to have harmful parasite risk if you're feeding um, invertebrates to vertebrates versus if you're feeding a vertebrate to another vertebrate. Um, um, because very often these, these, um, parasites have essentially a symbiotic relationship with their host to some extent, and they may be able to host on this insect, but they're not evolved and suited to hosting on, on a reptile. And again, this is, this is, um, speaking in broad strokes, there are exceptions to that, but I think it's something to keep in mind in terms of mitigation. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's kind of nice. what, I would, what I would add for that little section there. That's perfect. That's that's just great, man. That's uh, and that that actually brings what I had to a close. That's that's pretty much it. Yeah. <laughs> and again, you know. I think that with this with this with this conversation too, it's really this is really meant to be an introductory, um, you know, kind of like catalyst to to look into your own environment and, and do your own research about what's local to you, what's available to you, what your animals might benefit from. Um, and you know, this, this particular subject is so can get so granular and so large that it would be impossible for us to like, you know, give you the, the, the wild feeding manual, you know, in the space of a single webinar. So this is really about kind of encouraging, this as something to think about and explore on your own, um, and, and look into resources online. Again, like there's tortoise table is a great one. There's another, this is an old one that some of y'all might know. Um, but Melissa Kaplan's website and apsid.org oh, yeah. has some excellent resources for, um, finding what plants are great for feeding your herbivorous reptiles. And there's also resources there on parasites and stuff like that as well. So highly recommend checking out those resources and, um, and local field guides, all that kind of stuff. So, um, with all of that said, I think it would be a good moment to transition to our Q and a section, um, here for a bit yeah. before we do our raffle. So yeah. if you have Absolutely. questions, um, in, feel free to put them into the live chat and we will, um, we'll get to them as quickly as we can. Mm hmm. I'm also scrolling through the chat here to see if there's anything I've missed while I was ranting. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, let's see here. Oh, yeah. Some interesting, cool conversation happening in the chat, too, by the way. This is great. Really, really interesting. Yeah, I'm seeing just being able to see it now here. So on my just so everyone knows on my screen, I can't actually see the live chat. So I have it up on my phone. And so if I'm looking away from the screen, that's why. Yeah. Oh, yeah, this is a good point. Yeah, Katie dids and cicada. These are ones I've really wanted to catch and feed to my animals. I just haven't gotten around to it yet. I'm, I'm really excited to find some of those here and, and offer those up to, to some of my animals because I'm sure they'd go nuts. Oh, this is cool. This uh, this one, Gollums, says, I actually go to Asian markets and uh, the frogs they sell are local to where uh, I can't pronounce that Latin is. <laughs> That's pretty cool. That's a clever way of, of getting, at it, getting at it. That's fun. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, leopard geckos do love scorpions. I've seen that as well. Man, the real Martians hate raid through the. <laughs> it's okay. That's, That's okay. all right. You don't have. I'm fine with crit critique. Yes, wild hornworms are super dangerous. That's very true. Let's see. Um... 
Yeah, invasive stink bugs. That's one I don't. I have no idea. I, I I have absolutely no clue if those are any good or not. I I would dodge it personally, but uh, I I don't know. Uh, maybe Roy might have more insight on that. So wait, which which one was that? I'm sorry. Uh, someone it. someone asked a question uh, that says, "What about invasive stink bugs?" I would tend to avoid stink bugs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's there are one that can sometimes have toxic, um, and again that aposematic coloration. Oftentimes they have that that bright coloration as a warning. Um, and it's something actually I notice um, that the local lizards around me don't eat them. So that's yeah, another thing that I pay that. attention to is I like to actually um, observe my local fence lizards and watch them hunting and see what they're yeah. they're taking after um, and avoid the yeah. things that they avoid. Right. Um, here's some good, great questions I'm getting to here. Uh, Phil, how cool do you look catching grasshoppers with a butterfly net? Butterfly net, and the answer to that is as cool as you imagine. Actually, Phil, that says how do you look cool, not how cool oh, do yeah, you no, look. Oh yeah, no, I don't. Oh, snap. <laughs> I, no, I don't look cool. That's that's for sure. Um, clairvoyant asks, do scorpions need to be prepared in any way to avoid injuries, or are they find just this is a really good tank? question. Just, it's an amazing question. Yeah. So short answer, yes. Long answer, not always. Right. So it depends a little bit on what you're feeding. I used to feed collared lizard scorpions with absolute, absolutely no modification done to the scorpions, and they did just fine. With that said, some people uh, that I'm aware of will um, kind of crunch the pointy end of the tail of a scorpion in mm -hmm. order to avoid get the sting from that scorpion to the captive herp, and that's totally fine too. Um, probably the better thing to do generally speaking anyway, or, or even just hold when you're, if you're offering it on tongs, hold, yep. hold it by the stinker with the tongs while the animal yeah, grabs right. it. Um, that's, that's another way to avoid it. Yeah. I love that. That's a great point, Roy. Um, electric pollens asks for catching wild insects. What is your typical method? Just a net hands, or do you use any sort of traps? Yeah. I just use a, a typical butterfly net that they make for kids and mm -hmm. little jars and my hands. I mean, all of the above, right? Whatever I can do to actually get my hands on those bugs. It's whatever's easiest for you. Yeah. I've never used a trap of any kind. I'm sure there are people who might have, uh, you know, great, great information. Um, you know, just, uh, you know, it, uh, or not great information, but great, great utility out of traps. I've just never done that myself. Yeah. Um, I also use a butterfly net usually or my hands and I just pounce on them. You know, it's good practice for catching lizards and stuff too. You know, I got a lot of that as a right. kid, so that's, that's what I rely on there. But, um, a good website for getting things like nets and stuff like that is, um, Carolina biological supply. Um, they sell like actual, like kind of like research equipment and stuff like that. So the quality of like the butterfly nets and stuff that they sell, there's a lot better than like the little plastic ones that break that you might find yeah. at your local box store. Totally. Um, so highly recommend those. Those are nice. Um, yeah. Oh, and then the, the real Martian, I'm not, I was just messing with you. It's fine. Be a, please be a hater. Criticism's great. It's no problem. I was just joking we around. We welcome anyway. the criticism. Yeah, hopefully good. like it's the good. I appreciate your encouragement the real Martian to uh to to advocate for research cuz I hope I I got to that um sufficiently towards the end of the conversation before mm -hmm. we switched to the live chat but I, I I would again encourage that in all circumstances. Yeah, um, that's for Kendra Johnson the second website I recommended was anapsid.org that's a n a p s i d dot org and that's a uh, Melissa Kaplan who was a uh, I don't know if Melissa Kaplan's still doing herpetoculture stuff or I don't what the story so. is. I don't think so, but was just an amazing um, researcher and just compiler of information for um, keeping herps. And the website is still up and still still has a lot of useful yep. information on it, despite being kind of dated at this point. Yeah, uh, this is a great question. Danny's Dino Park, what are your opinions on having feeders that can thrive and live in a naturalistic setup? like roaches so the lizard can hunt and scavenge on a random schedule. This is a super cool question. Yes, so, I love this one. Um, th this is really interesting to me, and I probably have an opinion on this that differs from Roy's. I'm not 100% sure. Um, I I happen to, so I I am, I don't know exactly if I'm, okay, let me, let me, let me say this in a way that's as cryptic as possible. I happen to know two different individuals who worked at a zoological facility that will not be named in which they had a very um, 
healthy population of two different species of wild roach that lived in this in the facilities on the zoo grounds mm -hmm. okay and these roaches were in all of the habitats mm -hmm. and so there's a couple of ways i think to look at this one might say the animals will choose for themselves on what schedule they want to feed hunt and scavenge which is cool my perspective on this is I have relinquished control and uh, relinquished an avenue for information gathering on my animal. Because is my animal not eating because they've been eating all the wild roaches that live in their environment? Or is my animal not eating because it's not well? There's a problem, right? Like maybe there's not, it's sick or something like that. So I am not in favor of having naturalistic setups that allow the animals to feed on their own and whenever they want. I prefer to have control over that because it gives me a barometer on how my animals are doing. Um, Roy, I would really love to hear your perspective. So for me, it's a both and. Um, it's not like the oh, okay. only way I feed my animals. Definitely not. Um, I primarily like for for my insectivorous, I think that's mostly, this question's mostly, I think, um, directed at insectivorous species. So. All my insectivorous herps, I tong feed primarily. Um, however, I also keep everything in um, biotope style setups. So there's live plants, and you know, it's a I'm I'm trying to replicate a little vastly reduced and simplified ecosystem for my reptiles, and um, and I do keep um, isopods in there. I do occasionally release um, roach species in there, and um, I have noticed that they the reptiles will pick them off occasionally um, and i think that that's a good just it's i think of it as kind of like a supplemental feeder for them and a supplemental yeah. option and um i actually in in the case of my um spilodes vivarium i have a big vivarium um, it's a mixed species display that has spilodes the big amazon puffing snakes and i also have a couple species of lizards in there and the original reason why i introduced lizards into that vivarium was because I had a lot of isopods and I also introduced dubia roaches into that vivarium as part of the cleanup crew. And I wanted something in there to help manage their populations. And that's actually worked out really, really well. So those lizards, I still do, again, I still primarily tongue feed them, all kinds of, of a broad variety of stuff, but they supplementally feed on those isopods and dubia roaches that are living in the vivarium as well. And I think it's great. Yeah, I, 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 I totally agree with that. Uh, this is an interesting question, too. Do you know that there is a grasshopper breeder in the U.S.? Yes, I am very well aware of that, and I think that's one of those situations where you want to be really, really careful because various states will have various regu regulations around what uh, insect animals you can import or export from your state. The same thing is true of reptiles, right? Like some states, you cannot import export animals into or out of that state of certain kinds. The same thing is true of insects and other critters. So mm -hmm. just be aware of that whenever you buy yep. uh, feeders uh, of this kind. I also noticed we skipped over one uh, from Brianna oh. A. And it was, oh, sorry. if aphids grow on your garden foods, is it safe to clean off and feed um, to your euro? Oh. Oh yeah, yeah. That's fine. You can just wash them off. I mean, they're not going to sweat it. They, yeah. they've, I've fed, I've fed leaves with aphids on them and never had anything happen. So I would imagine it's not a big deal. But you can wash them off. Yeah. Sorry, Brianna. I didn't mean to overlook that question. Um, let's see. Whoa. <laughs> I don't have any input on the Chinese pattern fly. Um, yeah, neither do I. Unfortunately, that's one I would I would suggest doing some research on that one, Google and seeing if there's any um, anything related to a potential poisons or toxins that that species might carry. But I do say that the you know the red wings do give me a bit of pause, just again for that aposematic coloration aspect. Mm. Oh yeah, here's another great question too. Um, how far away from a suburban area or farm would you recommend a safe cat uh, for catching feeding insects as far as possible? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So, the, you know, the reality is like the closer you move towards a, a, a densely populated area or farm, the more risk you may run. And again, it doesn't even mean that you will be running a risk. You just could be. Right. And so it, it really comes down to, to how comfortable with with risk are you and generally speaking for me that that always comes down to i'm not that comfortable with a lot of risks so i try mm -hmm. to go as far away as possible 
Um, but it's not, a, but I don't, I don't know. I don't have enough information to know exactly how far it would be, you know, considered safe or not. I, that's uh, way outside my, my wheelhouse. Um, let's see what else we got in here. Yeah. Sorry, Brianna. I'll stop biting my nails. I didn't even notice I was doing that. <laughs> Busted. <laughs> Whoa, dude. <laughs> let's see. Uh, Um, why do I primarily use tong feeding instead of releasing the insects in the enclosure? Um, mostly that's just for management. Um, and because a lot of the, the insects that I offer to uh, my reptiles would quickly escape and hide in the enclosure in places where the, the reptiles wouldn't get to them. So for example, I like to offer a bunch of roach species that if I offer them to my polycris and I just release them, they're very fast and they'll just immediately run off and then get into the leaf litter and disappear. And the polycris do not forage in leaf litter to catch their food at all. They're fully um, passive feeding strategists. So they just basically sit in their branches and wait for something to crawl by. And um, it's easier for me to make that happen with some tongs than it is to release the roaches in there. Mm. The same thing can be oh, true for here. crickets. A lot of things... I'll, the other thing is a lot of feeders that we tend to feed our reptiles are actually nocturnal, whereas a lot of our reptiles are diurnal. And so sometimes that can create a conflict where the feeders will scatter and they'll hide and then they'll come out at night. And it, that can create yeah. a conflict in terms of, you know, when the animals are active and looking to feed versus when the feeders are active. Absolutely. But I'm not yeah. opposed to scatter feeding either when it's appropriate. I think it's great to, to be able to do a mix of both. I can say I can safely say that there have been plenty of times where I've like uh, in in several different cages uh, here at my place where I've like overturned rocks that have like a bunch of roaches or mealworms underneath them and I'll catch those and feed them to stuff and I'm like yes yes extra feeders it's been really cool <laughs> uh, let's see uh, I, I'm gonna go backwards here so Denise Malone um, yeah wild hornworms are mad toxic right because yeah because uh, of what Night what shades. they've been eating so yeah yeah definitely don't definitely don't feed that um the only reason we can feed the ones that we get at the shop is because they're being fed a diet that doesn't have the the nightshades in it yeah so they're not uh yeah. really problematic um and then uh pj link uh, says is it a problem to feed saltwater minnows or crabs and such this is a really challenging question because um I, again, I don't know. This is a this is a big. I have no idea. But I would wager, um, I would wager uh, it's probably not a huge deal. Um, but you know, again, I, I don't really know. I've, I, that's something I've never done. So I'm way outside my wheelhouse there. Yeah, and yeah, everyone's everyone's affirming that. But yeah, definitely avoid anything that that is in the nightshade family or any. Thing oh, yeah. that hosts on things in the nightshade family so you don't want to feed anything like tomatoes potatoes that kind of stuff to your reptiles um, um the leaves of them and then yeah. you don't you yeah, wouldn't yeah. want to heat feed any like you know or like uh, tobacco hornworms or tomato hornworms um the ones that we get you know from the feeder stores they're again like phil said they're raised on a, a diet that is not nightshade based so it's not poisonous to our reptiles and uh, it's worth noting, too, that there also is another exception to that peppers like bell peppers. Mm -hmm. A lot of a lot of reptiles can have bell peppers in very small in small amounts. Yeah. Um, Euromastics, a lot of them go bananas for little slivers of bell pepper. They go crazy for them. Keep it minimal, though. Right. Because yeah. a, a, pep, a bell pepper is a nightshade. So, yeah, don't go nuts. But they do. They do eat those occasionally. Um uh, even Bert Langerwerf used to feed tomatoes to a lot of, <laughs> he used to feed tomatoes to a lot of his stuff. Interesting. You're like, you, what are you doing, dude? Like, no. Well, it's <laughs> interesting. Cause like a lot of these folks, like I'm sure like Sandfire, I'm sure Bert. Yeah. Um, I'm sure, I mean, well, we know from Ron and Heather, you know, at fairy tale dragons, our good friends, a lot of yeah. them, um, actually relied on wild insects that infiltrated yeah. their, their outdoor, uh, vivaria. Um, to help feed their animals. And um, yep. they did so for decades without negative consequences. And actually, in many cases, some of those um, producers produce some of the finest, healthiest animals in herpetoculture. 
Um, yes. Just some food for thought yes. there. Yeah. It's, and it's, I, I feel like it's also worth just reminding people too, that like, uh, many, let's remember like, again, let's just take Euromastics cause that tends to be where I have the most information, right? Uh, or not, not the most of anybody, but just, I, the, the amount of information I have, I, I just have a lot on euros, right? Uh, a lot of wild ornate Euromastics, most of what they're feeding on is acacia trees, right? Mm. Great, great food. None of the of the foods that we buy for them here in captivity resemble anything structurally, nutritionally, not even close to what an acacia tree looks like. Yeah. Right. So the reality is that most of the animals that we keep well in captivity have a level of adaptability to various food styles that is worth noting. It doesn't mean, you know, like just because you're feeding your animal collard greens or endive and that's what you read on a care guide that says, oh, your amastics do well with these foods and you should never feed them kale doesn't mean that you can't feed them kale and get good results, mm -hmm. right? We're talking about like we're splitting hairs. It's like collard greens versus kale. It's like none of those re resemble an acacia tree at all, not even close. Mm -hmm. So we're already making huge trade-offs in what we're feeding. And that's one of the other reasons that wild foods are so helpful is because they are going to more closely resemble the things that our, our, our pets would, would be eating were they in the wild. So it's, it's a great thing to try to give them those things when, and if we can, it's going to help lengthen their lives. Um, the whole yep. kit and caboodle, yep. it's just going to make them better. So just remember this. Yeah. I just want to note a couple things. So ground X offered that, um, they have seen Robins try to eat lantern flies, um, in the Bronx and they could not get them sure. down. So that's a good, um, indication that lantern flies might not be on the menu for our herps. They also noted that, um, and this is something that I think I was aware of as well, which is that with the nightshades, it's actually the leaves that we're concerned about. So the fruits have very low levels of the toxins. Um, so like the bell pepper mm. and the tomato feeding it is less of a concern than, um, than what the actual, uh, the, the foliage would be. The fruits, um, don't have the same issue, which is kind of amazing, mm. honestly. Yeah. yeah and also true. Sherry, Sherry just, um, affirmed that as well. I love that black yeah. soldier fly established themselves in my compost in large numbers. Yeah. That's something I've noticed as well, that black soldier fly yeah. are just all in my compost and they're, that's a great feeder, um, for your reptiles. Yeah. yeah. Very and, much. So. Um, so it's a great one. Yeah. Uh, I love that. Here. It's great stuff. Um, Danny's dino park. Do you know of certain greens that may grow well in insectivorous enclosure that can be fed to herbivorous animals? I've never, I don't have any idea. I'm not sure at all. I, I generally think that plants, um, growing plants inside of an enclosure for a reptile can be really hard to do. You have to select your pet plants carefully because they get trampled so regularly. They get, they get overused because, you know, those plants in a wild environment might only get walked on once or twice every now and again. Whereas in a captive setting, they're just going to get walked on all the time by the, by the captive herb. Right. But I've never, it yeah, please. Depends on it the species depend. totally. because I do actually, I do grow, uh, plants in, in some of my vivaria specifically for the reptiles to eat. And it's actually go. worked really, really well. So, but that's also with the polychris, which again, are right. Pretty delicate little lizards in comparison to a Euro, which is more yeah. of the tank, the tank yeah. style of uh, design. Yeah. Good luck. Good <laughs> yeah. Luck. I've, I've never seen anybody, I've never managed to see anybody growing what, like plants inside of a Euromastix enclosure. Yeah. I've never really seen it work in any way that really makes a lot of sense. I mean, even, even wheat grass, you can take like cat grass or wheat grass in a little thing and you can plant that in an enclosure and put it in like a very difficult to reach spot the yeah. euros will get up there and just mow it down <laughs> yeah. and you're like god damn it guys stop it i also cool. just it looks like we also uh sherry also noticed no, noted that um some cities can't afford to use pesticides and herbicides right. on public ground which is very true um yeah. and so if you're right. if you're in a place where you can get in contact with the um, management about what their protocol is that's a great way to you know affirm whether or not it's safe to um collect in the city um, and on the question regarding a specific microscope, um, I don't yeah. remember the exact model off the top of my head, but I do know that, um, there is a resource called beautiful dragons, um, reptile yeah. rescue, and they offer, um, a lot of 
kits for um, doing your own fecals at home, including microscopes. And so I would recommend them as a resource for um, investigating that. Let's see, anything else in here? Oh yeah, my, my Euros avoid mint like the plague. I don't know why. They're supposed to be great food for them, but they don't touch it. I think they hate the, the pungent aroma of mint. Huh. I don't know why. They really, ugh, they just spit it out. They run away. I've actually, I will get video of them running away <laughs> from mint, which is so funny uh, because I've tried, I'm like it grows all over and it's such a powerful weed and it just, yeah. And I would love to be able to feed that because it'd be such a cheap food source and they don't want to touch it. Clairvoyant. That's cool. That is super cool to know the real Martian. That's is there cool. a way to find the nutritional inf information for wild insects? That's a great question. And yeah, I think it's going to be hard. It's super hard because it can really vary so much. I think that there are, I mean, there's definitely like Google scholar. I would, um, I would recommend typing in some keywords like reptile feeder insects, nutritional profile, things like that. And you'll find some comparisons of just the, the basic common fevers, but in terms of like wild insects, I think it's going to be a lot harder to find that information and track it down. You can you can kind of extrapolate some degree based on family of insect, but it's pretty hard. Yep. Uh, yeah, ground X one. I have tried basil's, and it's the same thing. Um, in fact, for my euros, the most pungent thing I've ever actually seen them consume is bee balm. So if you guys are familiar with that flower, the bee balm flower is big big little puffy kind of magenta colored flower super pungent and and uh a lot i had quite a few animals that rejected it just because of its pungency but then some that came back to it especially as it dried out um now they'll eat it totally fresh um but that's the most pungent thing my my euros will take the euros anyway right some of the some of the very like the like the tinocera conspicuosa he'll eat anything he's a dork uh Mendel eats anything you throw at him that's colorful, but um, mm -hmm. he doesn't seem as bothered by the pungency of some of those things. Um, uh, my 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 uh, my my hingeback tortoises don't like things that are super pungent. They didn't want to touch any of it. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of some other examples here. Um, oh, and oddly, my butterfly agamas really like uh, pungent flowers. They like bee balm too, which is pretty wild. I always found that one uh, pretty pretty unique um let's see um i will post links um after the this this is finished i'll go and edit the video description and post some links there for um like beautiful dragons and the websites that we mentioned earlier for um resources and yeah the real martian if 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 there are um insects that people eat um, mm. you will be able to find information on them. So that's a really valuable way to look for it as oh, well. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Very nice. This spring, there will be a once in a lifetime opportunity of sourcing wild in insect food with the emergence of two broods of cicadas. Sicada. Yeah, this is a really, really exciting one. Um, for those of y'all that get the, get the broods I, where I am, I don't really see that, but, um, um, pretty cool. And I don't know, I, unfortunately, I have, in terms of preserving them, I don't know. Um, I would have to, I'd have to research that. I'm sure they're good. I'm sure they're totally fine. I'm sure they're super healthy. Like everything eats those things. I'm sure. Yeah. They're, they're know, such I a would... larder, especially with two broods. <laughs> yeah. Hey, have it, have is has anyone seen the, um, the videos of copperheads eating cicadas? Yes. Oh, yeah. Which is, that's a pretty unusual thing. A, you know, a venomous Super pit stuff. viper eating cicadas. Pretty cool. Yeah. But they actually really rely cool. on those broods. Really, really cool. I highly recommend looking that up if you haven't seen it yet. It's just wild to see a, a pit viper eating an insect. Yeah, 100%. All right. Well, you think maybe we should uh, yeah. bump, bump up to the... Uh... I think we should get to our raffle. Um, yeah. Um, with our with our, the help of our happy dragons homies. Um, again, for folks that are interested in signing up, the monthly and the um, quarterly subscription links are both here in the chat and in the video description. Um, so check it out. 
I think that this is something that actually has like really amazing value for um, the herb community. So definitely consider trying it out and seeing if you can find the same. Um, so how are we doing this raffle? Let me um, send a quick text guy. to our team real quick. <laughs> Sick. <laughs> I think that they, cause they have to do it off. Like they are, there's, we had tried to do this with a, 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 a code essentially that we could use in the chat, but it wasn't working unfortunately in our test stream. So we're having to do it more manually and, um, they're hooking it up. Excuse me. Yeah, and then also, so in the future, um, these webinars that we're that we've been doing, this is part of a series that we've been doing. Um, these are going to continue, and they're going to be moved over to the Happy Dragons Plus platform. Um, that's also, you know, the raffles and everything. That's all going to be over there. So if you do want to continue to um, enjoy these these free webinars we've been putting on, they are going to be moving over to Happy Dragons Plus. So make sure to sign up there if you want to continue to to watch these and participate. This is fun. I really enjoyed doing this. This was a fun one to talk about. And these were easily some of the coolest uh, coolest questions we've gotten so far, in my opinion. Very insightful. I mean, all the questions we've gotten so far have been great at each webinar, but this... Yeah, this is great. More. I really just, yeah. yeah. One... Also just would express appreciation to everybody for um, participating and, and for the good feedback to both, both critical and encouraging. All of it is welcome. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's, it's, it's great. There's also just a lot of knowledge in this chat, so that's <laughs> cool. really cool to see. Okay. Oh, this is so cool. So... Wow. We have a winner. So our winners for the first three months, um, that's the um, three months three three months free of Happy Dragons Plus. Our first three winners are Denise Malone, Isabella Canavas, and Danielle Slipsky. And I hope I pronounced your names correctly. I apologize if I did not. I'm doing my best. But... Um, uh, Catherine over at Happy Dragons will find your at and will tag you um, to um, yeah to get you your your prizes. So those are our first three. Thank you so much for participating. I'm stoked. And we'll go cool. move on to the next ones here shortly. Very cool. <laughs> this is awesome. This is super fun. <laughs> So the way that people are getting picked is everyone in the chat has been put into a like a like a random generator that's like a it's like a virtual wheel that's picked um, like a a spinning wheel. So that's how that's how it's going from the RSVP list. I think it's actually from the chat. Yeah, I think she. I think I think we were having people put high. If they type high in the chat, they were entered. Yeah. And I'm gonna watch the UFC tonight. Good day today. It's an exciting <laughs> day, Phil. So congrats to our first three again. That was um That's so cool. Oh, let's see. We've got our next two coming for the stickers. I should be receiving the text here momentarily. So for our stickers plus <laughs> three funny. months free of Happy Dragons, we have Golems. And Gorilla Day per KCAL. So cool. thank you, y'all, for participating and enjoy the sticker pack and three months of Happy Dragons Plus free. Way cool. And then our uh, final winner will be announced here shortly. This is for the big one. The three big months, <laughs> three months free of Happy Dragons Plus and a hundred dollar gift card to Josh's frogs for all those delicious feeders and supplies. 
Golems, yes, uh, good matchups for the UFC. Uh, the main card is Alexander Volkanovsky and um, uh, uh, why am I blanking on uh, the opponent's name, Roy? Help me. Ilya Tapuria. Yes, Tapuria. That's right. Thank you. I don't so, know how I remember um, that, but all I right. Don't know how I... We got our winner for the gift card is Brianna A. Brianna, dude. Well done. <laughs> well done. Right on. Congrats so to cool. all of the winners. <laughs> To everybody who participated in the chat and just um, in the video in general, again, thanks to everyone. And um, one last reminder, uh, yeah, pretty soon here, all this is going to transfer over at Happy Dragons Plus. So sign up if you want to continue to enjoy these webinars, um, continue to enjoy these courses that we're going to be dropping here soon. It's going to be similar to this, but a lot more in-depth, a lot more granular information. I'm really excited about that personally, something I've been um, working on for a while now. And... Um, yeah, all of those amazing other features that I spoke about at the beginning of the show. Um, it's really, I think, again, an excellent value. So check it out. Any uh, closing remember, remarks, Phil? Uh, yeah, I was just going to say, remember that our next webinar is going to be uh, over the history of herpetoculture. Right. So this is going to be super fun. It'll be really unique and interesting. Um, I think this is one that I uh, is a little challenging because uh the, the the documentation around a lot of this stuff is like kind of sparing but yeah uh, we can get we can get really interesting general gists of of where we've all come from and i i just I, one of the reasons i'm excited about it is because it it doesn't just our industry doesn't start with the drug trade right i think we have a tendency <laughs> because of books like the lizard king and stolen world and whatever uh -huh. we a lot of us have a tendency to think like oh it all started with with putting coke in inside of snakes oh, no. it across the border but it's not true really it's really does not it, it goes way way back way before that so just, yeah just that is true bear that in mind yes it is true damn it <laughs> all right everybody <laughs> so thank you so much um really appreciate y'all and um for those winners um yeah get in, get in touch with happy dragons it looks like um brianna uh, email hello at happydragons.com about um, about your your reward and um, for everyone else we'll get in touch so thanks again for everyone's participation and we'll see you soon hopefully over on happy dragons plus have a wonderful cool. weekend <laughs>